No, ain't nobody got time for that. It's flip class. Today we're going to talk about this young, attractive looking man. But also we're going to talk about this old and possibly frightening looking man. We're talking about Charles Darwin. Get a little more in depth with Darwinism. Just give you a little backstory. Darwin came up with this idea, like many of you know, while he was traveling on the HMS Beagle, a ship that came out of Plymouth, England. Plymouth also being where other things like pilgrims came from. Ah, see, now you're thinking about historical connections. Now, this was a thing that uh, people in their like late tweens, early 20s just tended to do back then. Just sort of hanging out on ships going around the world. It was like a coming of age type of thing. And uh, young hot Darwin, he was sort of a expert, or at least a jack of all trades. He was in a job that's known then as a naturalist, which sort of meant that he was kind of an expert in the fields of biology, marine biology, oceanography, meteorology, and geology. So you can see that if you're going on a wooden ship and you're just floating in the ocean, you're going to all these weird places that people don't usually go, including the Galapagos Islands and even over here down in Australia, which was still where you know the prisoners were and the scariness. So you'd see why you want to have somebody like that around. Fun little like wives' tale that a lot of geologists like to tell is that Darwin, somewhere down over here, had to be drugged kicking and screaming off of a volcanic island because it was erupting and he wanted to watch. So this is the kind of guy that we're dealing with here, Darwin. Now when he went to the Galapagos Islands and he checked out these islands, he noticed something weird happening, sort of similar with your stick bugs. He noticed that these finches which are, you know, little birds that eat stuff. They, they had a weird, uh, like, variation on the island. And each of the islands seemed to have its own style of finch that was better than the other finches at surviving. And they were all finches. They are all shaped very similar, always all colored very similar. But they had these really different beaks. And because he was a naturalist, and by naturalist I mean huge freaking nerdoid, he just watched the finches and was like, ha, huh, look it, these ones eat fruit and these ones eat grubs, these ones use weird tools, these ones eat insects, and those ones eat leaves, which isn't even an animal at all. But he noticed that in addition to having different diets, these ones eat seeds too, which is what the ones in uh, South America near there, and also the ones in England that they stole from South America eat as well. But he noticed that they had these different beaks that seemed to help them do their job better or worse, depending on what their job was. And so just like, you know, the stick bugs in our lab, he saw that the differences in the niche, the differences in the situation that the bird was expected to fill, left some birds to be a little bit better than other birds. And he wrote this whole uh, book, well, he wrote a publication, really, huge thing, really long, called On the Origin of Species. Now, Darwin wasn't the only one thinking about these sorts of things. There are many other scientists, one that we're going to look at in class and compare with Darwin. But he just, well, he's sort of out there and he was thinking about, you know, the struggle to survive and the fierce competition with life and death situations. Ironically, while he was dying of malaria, don't worry kids, he didn't die. Remember, he became old, creepy looking Darwin later. But he wrote this thing called The Origin of Species, and he only mentioned evolution once in like the whole thing, like in the last word. So he was just thinking about, you know, it wasn't like, oh, things have changed. It was, no, no, people are already thinking, okay, things have changed, things are different here and there. His idea was a mechanism explaining why the things were changing and why they were different. And so evolution, because we're in our evolution, yeah, that, is sort of the natural conclusion of natural selection. Right? And uh, sort of like today, natural selection was not received very well. He pretty much spent most of the rest of his life, Darwin, in exile for his uh, publication. And uh, yeah, it didn't, didn't go so well. But let's talk about the speed of the changing. We can actually measure evolution looking at the geologic time scale, which means we're looking in preposterously large increments of time. 
but it's all based on the reproduction rate. So things like bacteria over here that reproduce really fast, they're going to also evolve very fast. We've actually watched bacteria just in our lifetime evolve. That's why like medicines that I took when I was a kid are no longer useful. Like you almost never get tetracycline for anything anymore because a lot of bacteria have adapted to it and changed so that it's no longer effective. All right, larger organisms like us that reproduce more slowly, they're going to have a much slower rate of change over time, which sort of makes sense. People, sort of though, have an extra special situation, and we'll talk about this more in class, but I want you to be thinking, is natural selection applying to people? I mean, I'm not talking about like, you know, tribal peoples in Africa where species originated. I'm talking like right here, right now, 21st century, I have heating, plumbing, air conditioning in the summer. Is natural selection still something that is affecting me? Which brings us to the exciting topic of speciation. Speciation, uh, sort of like a sub-term underneath evolution. This is where one species changes and become a new species. That's why we call it speciation, because one species changing into a different species. Could be from macroevolution, could be from microevolution. Either way, it's just any time that the species is no longer that same species. And if you think back to our definition, what we were using for our definition of a species, two organisms that can get together and make the babies that could also get together and make more babies, you can see that it doesn't really take a huge amount of change. So in the case of uh, like these bugs, which are kind of similar to our stick bugs, you can look at having, you know, uh, organisms that have a certain amount of diversity and if they were somehow isolated from each other, like let's say you took all the one from one box and put it in another box, you can see that over time, the two groups, if they were geographically isolated, could change differently depending on what their scenario was accepting. For example, those red bugs are really easy to get, or like the green bugs, they're relatively easy to get. What if the green bird wasn't hugging it out by the other box, the green eating bird? Over time, you'd see that the tan ones in the one box will continue to do better and better because they are really, really hard to find. But the green ones over here in the other box would do better because the predator wasn't there. Over time, if these two groups of insects changed just enough that they would no longer interbreed with each other, right? They bring them back together and the green ones are like, no, nah, we don't like those brown ones, the brown ones are like, nah, I don't want them. The green ones, those would actually be different species now. That's speciation. This is microevolution. There's a really cool study done with uh, grasshoppers, sort of the same, or crickets, sorry, a really cool study with crickets, sort of the same idea. They took crickets, separated over the course of two seasons, just two seasons, not like you, seasons. The crickets in the one field had changed up their little mating song just enough that they would no longer intermix. That speciation, that's microevolution, just these itty bitty little changes. And so think about like uh, doggies, man best friend. We got wolves, we got dogs, we got the fox. What does the fox say? All very similar, all canine, all have the big scary fang teeth, all eating meat, etc., etc. Think about, you know, three things that they have in common. Which one came first? So in, uh, today in class, we're going to look at um, some different changes for species over time and then on Wednesday, we're going to make a diagram that looks sort of like this, showing that the foxes came before the wolves and dogs. It's weird, isn't it? Thanks for watching, everybody. Don't forget to moodle. Links down in the canoodle.